Something came from box from box from box. Something came from box from box from box. Life of a lobbyist with a kill on something came from Baltimore. Welcome to Something Came From Baltimore. My name is Tom Gowker, and today you're listening to Akil Patterson. The, the thoughts and the ideas from this man, um, I have been a fan of his work for years, and he is someone that you need to listen to. We wanted to do a, a podcast, and what we thought about is his social messaging. We were going through his Facebook about his posts, his thoughts on his posts. He is a lobbyist, but I want him to explain who he is and where he's coming from. This is more of an opinion show from, from his point of view. I see nothing but great things in his future. I'm, I've been a fan, and that's why you'll get a couple shows where it's the Akil show. It's the life of a lobbyist with Akil. Uh, welcome to Something Came From Baltimore. Thanks for having me on, Thomas. What we want to do is we just want to go through your Facebook postings because you do have a fan base of people who like to comment back. Um, we may go a little, <laughs> it just, this is a, for day one. We want to do that. I guess, let me even back this up. Let's uh, meet and greet and explain who you are to everyone. So people know. Well, my name is Akil Patterson. Uh, I am a registered lobbyist, uh, on the state and local levels. Um, I have gone across the country working on behalf of marginalized groups, um, was very influential in helping marriage equality pass in the, in the state of Maryland. And then from there, it kind of snowballed into me doing a lot of work with sports teams, sports leagues. And then I ended up being a lobbyist for the Maryland State Medical Society, at which point I uh, stressed myself out to the point where I gave myself an, an arrhythmic heartbeat that caused what some would call a heart attack at about 32 years old. Um, I quit my job and decided that I was not going to be stressed out anymore. And so I started my own firm and uh, haven't been stressed out for the last three years. That's crazy. You'd think it would be the opposite way, wouldn't it? you run your own business. Yeah. I'm excited to have you on here, and I want, I'm excited for people to hear your views on things that you post. I expect this to, to resonate. We didn't want to go back too far into the, the past because um, we know that our news changes from day to day, but the first post thing you had was on May 20th. Trump Organization appeals ruling letting Democrats see Trump's financial records. This is the deal on this. You can either pass... Or you can elaborate. If you want to say pass, I'm totally fine. If you want to elaborate, let's go for it. <laughs> so I think that one was uh, the court's ruling had decided that the Deutsche Bank and his other subsidiary or other banks that have funded him were going to be allowed to show his, his record, basically, you know, his financials. I believe it's 100% fair. I mean, it's a just and even path to success and you know, if he is going to be operating as both a businessman and the president of the United States, we should be at least be able to see something that resembles a financial statement. He doesn't want to give us his taxes, and his his fan base definitely doesn't want us to see his taxes. They keep saying, well, Obama never showed his. Well, Obama actually did, uh, and Obama also showed his birth certificate, unlike Trump. So, um, yeah, it's just an easy thing, you know. Give the people what they want, you know, circuses and and, uh, and uh, gladiators. That's what they want. You know, it would seem to me like common sense. And then it would seem to be frustrating to his fan base that, OK, well, why aren't you giving out? Like, why? What's the problem? So we know that they're not being audited. It's the longest audit of all time. And we know that they exist. We know that he lost a lot of money. And we know that that he is pushing back. So, where's where is the the long game? Where what is the? I mean, as a fan of uh, Trump, wouldn't you just be frustrated and say, just do it? Well, you know, if, if anybody's if you're a fan of anybody, and you don't think they've done anything wrong. You do say, just give it up. Yeah, just give them what they want. Mm -hmm. But what his guys are so good at doing is they have this thing we call it the narrative spin, and they create a new. Oh, they're attacking me. Oh, they just want more information. Mm -hmm. I've given them financials. Well, you know what? If you have been audited before, and I've talked to a lot of accountants and a lot of lawyers, you're perpetually being audited. It's always going to happen. If you've been audited once, they're going to audit you most likely again because they found something irregular last time that was so egregious that they're going to look for something. So he says, I've already been audited. 
is always probably being audited. When you lose nine hundred million dollars, you're always going to be somebody's looking for you. I mean, you really think about it. He's not in jail because his his debt, the people that that own his debt, don't want him in jail. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know if you, you know, my family is originally from New York. So when people talk about Donald Trump built all these wonderful buildings and these successful businessmen, well, in New York back in the 70s and 80s, you didn't build squat without the mob. Because the mob controlled the union pensions. And because the union pensions were controlled by the mob, you had to go to them to build. So most likely, Rudy Giuliani is uh, Donald Trump's handler because Donald Trump most likely was a confidential informant through the 1970s and 1980s because he's the only person that isn't in jail that probably did business with the mob. You know, I'm from uh, Atlantic City, so uh, I've seen the damage that he's done uh, with those casinos and, uh, you know, the the, the constant suing and the, the, the people who all left their jobs without pay and uh, he's not a, there's no fan in Jersey. There's no fan in PA, in uh, New York. People know better. Yeah, but yet he, he's pawned himself off as some sort of working man, which isn't the facts. And it, it's crazy that people will keep believing him only because he says so many things that strike a chord with uh, a group that feels as though they're marginalized. They're not actually marginalized. They just feel as though they're marginalized. Mm-hmm. I mean, because I get it. You know, every time somebody says, Black Lives Matter, and you're like, well, what about my life? Or what about my son's life? Or if someone says trans lives matter, but like, well, what about my daughter who was cisgender born and she was attacked by a boy? Like, I get what they're coming from in their head, mm-hmm. but it's not the actuality. It's not reality. It's not like they're disproportionately impacted. Those are case by case situations. And that's what they always do. They always throw something little back at you. So, all right, let's move on away from Trump, though. You got, you got <laughs> the next could, one. That's a six-month uh, conversation. Oh, I know, I know, I know, I know. That's why I said, like, these, this stuff is, is hot, and it, it dies away, and you forget it even exists. Another post, we got Alabama's uh, anti-abortion governor urges respect for life will oversee the seventh execution. Yeah, she's terrible, isn't <laughs> uh, Well, you know what? Alabama's a very interesting state. We're talking about a state that up until, you know, 1973, 74, I think, when Bill Bear, Bear Bryant was still alive, the University of Alabama still was segregated. It's sports teams specifically. Mm-hmm. So although they allowed black students on campus in, I believe, 67, 68, or 68, there were not black athletes until years later. And that was because Bear Bryant lost a damn football game. Mm-hmm. And Bear Bryant said, we got to get us one of those. And I believe they lost to UCLA. I can't be too sure. But it was basically they, they lost a football game, and they decided that at that point they needed more African-American student-athletes. Um, so Alabama, the state where it only matters if you win a national title. Mm. I mean, even to this day, you can feel it. Like you know, in Tallahassee, you know, a friend of mine, like over on the tracks, they're seg- it's segregated. In Baltimore, it's segregated. It's just it's the worst when you the further down you get into the south. Yeah, yeah, it, it's pretty bad. But ultimately, I think a lot of people, um, I mean, if you look at uh, states like Tennessee, um, Tennessee has got this great migration happening right now, mainly because Nashville is blowing up, mm-hmm. right? And Nashville is going to become a very progressive, very left-leaning city. So that will change the state's dynamics substantially um, when it comes to, to uh, um uh, developing uh, new politicians and new policies and procedures. Are you ready to go to the next one? Yeah, absolutely. Alabama refuses television rights to air Arthur episode with gay wedding. I don't know who Arthur is. Who's Arthur? Uh, so Arthur, I think the first books of Arthur were probably written in the late 70s, uh, early 80s. Um, it is a character in which, you know, he has a little sister, uh, and he's got his friends, um, and they are, I think Arthur is an aardvark or an anteater or something like that. He's cute. Yeah, Arthur the aardvark. Yeah. Um, and his um, teacher is Mr. Ratburn. And for years on the cartoon, on the cartoon, his teacher has been very effeminate and very, you know, well-dressed man and, you know, had the little bustier or boutonniere or you know handkerchief um and finally i guess they decided to 
to have to allow the character to come out as gay and to have a wedding and because it is on public television Alabama felt as though they thought it was too inappropriate for children um but what I have found and it is uh, very interesting because my sister-in-law who is a uh, phenomenal professor uh, at a very prestigious college she said to me uh you know I have to tell my children uh constantly that their mommy doesn't have a penis and they understand and it's you know she's talking to like a five and a a, a three-year-old you know or you know so she understands that telling a child something early on she makes it kind of normal I, on the other hand, didn't really know what homosexuality was until I was almost an adult. And even then, I was like, well, I don't know if that's really me. But I think the more we just destigmatize um, this thing about homosexual love and relationships, the better off we will be. I believe that, you know, com- comprehensive sexual education in Alabama should be also legal, but it's not. I mean, they talk about, well, it- it's legal because we teach abstinence. Well, is that really comprehensive sexual education? Or are we just throwing the buck down the road a little bit? So Arthur is just one aspect of why Alabama kind of sucks at times. It's a karma alert. He wrote, uh, Trump appeal, now going to the court, headed by Merrick Garling. Uh, Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, That was a fun one. Um, So essentially, uh, he tried to block legislation, and and now Merrick Garland's the one that has to hear it, which is the same person that the Senate uh, told him that he wasn't going to become the nominee for the... Um, seat that was left open by uh, Scalia when he passed away. And then ultimately Trump pulled his nomination because he was now the president and he didn't want it. So he got what he deserved. I got infant taken from murdered mother's womb opens his eyes for the first time. How sad is that? That's from uh, WBAL TV. Yeah, yeah. uh, That's definitely a sad one. I thought I, I, I think I just posted that one because I think I just I posted that because it, it was just sad, you know. You you see things like this happen in multiple different la- levels: um, domestic violence, murders. Um, yeah, so just a sad thing. Uh, day three of anxiety it just means I have to work harder before this vacation. Work on Friday. Yeah. So right before um, I, I left, I went to uh, Mexico. Um, I have a ton of anxiety. A lot of people don't know um, because they, they assume I'm very outgoing. But the truth is, is just like everyone else, I, I have a tough time sometimes getting up for work. Um, and it's not because I, of anything like damaging. It's not like I'm I'm so sad that you know my life sucks. It's just that there's so many things that you think about when you're prepping for uh, you know the next piece of legislation or the next community meeting, or the next group meeting, or the next project you're working on, or, you know, it's crazy. I get people asking me all the time, can you help me invest in this? Can you help me with this project? Can you help me with that? And then I've got to decide, and I'm a yes guy. I I say yes to a lot of things. I'm one of those guys that I've got to decide, is this good for my health? This is good for me. Should I be doing this? I mean, a lot of these young people that are coming up to me and ask me for help, I want to help them, but sometimes I think, well, no one ever helped me, so shouldn't you do this on your own? Like, that's my thought process. It really is. I mean, a lot of people are like, oh, we've got to help the babies. I'm like, what's wrong with them letting them fail and learn? I've failed I mean, many times in my life, yeah. and uh, I've continued to fail. And Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think that's where a lot of people are at. I mean, they're, they're so – because they're fixated with their own. Um, 
and I'll just use I'll, I'll use the Trump supporter because it's it's easier. A Trump supporter is generally fixated on their family specifically, right? Like I'm just looking out for my kids and my little nest egg. Well, that's fine. But when you take a 10,000 foot view, you notice, well, you might be looking out for your family, but there's a train coming right at your house to knock you out. Like your house is going to be gone in six months. But because you were only focused on your family, you never noticed that your house was built on a railroad track. And now that train came through and it smacked you and killed everybody you knew. But you didn't recognize it until it was too late. That's what I feel as though a lot of people in different communities do, especially when we talk about identity politics. And I like that there are parts of your identity as you need to share. But as for the Democrats and their whole idea of identity politics all the time, you can't always talk about the gay, the black, the Jewish American, the Indian American, the Muslim American, the Arabic American, and have all of their issues and then say, but we got to work as Americans. It's like, well, you just named everybody that had something different. And yet now you're saying we're all Americans still, but they're all different. Like Trump and the Republicans are very good at messaging. They basically just say America and patriot. And we know it's cold language for white power, but that's another issue. I mean, you really just got to barrel down and say, what part of your identities can you say, all right, I can come back to that later. Um, so... Yeah, that's where that post came from. <laughs> I got deep. Uh, the next one is um, Robert F. Smith told Morehouse College class of 2019 that he's going to give him the ultimate gift of graduation. Um, I don't know about you, but I find him to be the most sexiest man in the whole entire world. It's not the fact that he's a multimillionaire, or it could be the fact that he's a multimillionaire. I don't know. But he's he, he needs to be on Dancing with the Stars. So, Rob Smith, uh, let me just tell, and I don't know if that one's the one that I put my little comment above, but that was the greatest marketing strategy ever. Now, a lot of my friends are like, what do you mean by marketing strategy? Rob Smith, neither of his wives have been black. I've always known this. Even he was the chairman over at uh, the Carnegie Mellon Hall, in which my uh, good buddy of mine uh, worked at. Uh, Rob is friends with Volga uh, Veronica Bulgari, who you, you've heard of Bulgari Jewelry Dynasty family? Uh, I don't do jewelry, but that's it. Go ahead. Yeah, right. well, it's a very big jewelry line, so they're, they're billionaires as well. So Rob has like lived this very like plush life, at least for the last twenty years, all right, at least the last twenty. But him giving this this this, and it wasn't him giving forty million, Rob only gave one million dollars as a personal gift the 40 million i believe is coming from his companies so not only will his companies be getting like this like huge like write-off essentially but the companies will also be making lifelong relationships with one of the most prestigious hbcus in america in which everybody who ever goes to morehouse or spellman will now just be clamoring to buy whatever products Rob Smith bought, uh, sells them for the next 100 years. Great move. He also knows, Rob Smith will know, that African Americans are the single largest purchasing block of a group in America. They spend more money than anybody. So Rob has put his name out there, and most likely his companies will leverage this into billions of dollars. So was $40 million worth it? Hell yeah, Rob Smith, you did a great job. Now people are going to bite back on his wife is Asian and or his ex-wife is Asian and his current wife is white. But you know what? Those uh, 200 plus students that graduated, I'm pretty sure all of them are really excited. A posting, it's a, uh, I'm not sure what the abbreviations are. So you're going to have the uh, M, S, P, and the B, that's Baltimore Police Department, I'm assuming. Uh, discuss joint review of Detective Sean Souter's death. Do you remember that? Oh, so that was the Maryland State Police and the uh, BPD. Mm -hmm. So they were actually, so um, as some people may or may not know that Sean Shutter, Souter was, um, he's dead. And uh, BPD said it was a, a, a suicide on duty 
after people said they, they witnessed him struggling with somebody. So uh, I'm glad that the Maryland State Police Department or, you know, decided that they were going to do this joint venture because in that, that same day, um, former commissioner, um, oh, oh, what's his name? The gentleman out of Prince George's County. I forgot his name now. Um, the former commissioner who had just left, he, he was at the math grad. He even went to Twitter and said, I don't think Zuder killed himself. And the fact that BPD said that he did is ridiculous. So, you know, there are a lot of people that are saying, and also, you know, his widow doesn't get to collect benefits either because they said it was a suicide. So you're telling me that a man on the job shoots himself and then runs away with his own gun? You know, something don't feel right. And also, this is the same time. This was weeks before the gun task force uh, ended up getting indicted. So, you know, nothing ever smells right. If it smells like crap, it most likely is shit. People who are listening thinking that they're going to hear a, a music review or, or listen to an artist, which we have some great talent coming up this month. This is uh, Life of a Lobbyist with Akil. We're speaking to Akil Patterson. I'm a firm believer that he is the face of, a, of the future. I, I'm giving him uh, the opportunity to go through some of his Facebook quotes and, and postings. Just give a little more perspective of it. I feel that his uh, opinion is, is a value, and that's why we got him on the show. So we're excited to have him. And... The next posting is just a personal one where he wrote, when I step out of faith to build a company reflective of who I was, I didn't know what would happen. Some three years later from the start till today, I'm happy that the little company that could is still here. Thank you to those clients that that support me and believe in what I do. Yeah, so I actually started my company uh, a little before the uh, heart attack kind of thing. And the reason I started was I, I was getting a little frustrated at work. I found out how much people made doing what I was getting paid pennies for. And you got to admit, like, like, let's just be very real. Most minorities don't realize how little or undervalued they're really being paid. They just don't. I mean, I mean, most women eventually learn how much they're not being paid. But when you aren't allowed to talk about salaries at work, you kind of just think, oh, well, I guess I'm making decent money. But then you go to meet your buddy at a bar, and he goes, yeah, I'm making 150. 150 what? 150,000 a year? And he's an employee. Now, imagine if you owned the company. Imagine if you sought your own clients out. Imagine if you spent that extra two to three hours, how much little work you sometimes do at that office. Like, yeah, I'll be very real. There were days where I'd be like, I'd get all my work done, in about four hours. And then I got to sit around and pretend like I'm doing something for four hours. Do you know how many days that week I was surfing the internet? Like, all right, well, I guess I'll click on this Pokemon game for a little bit. I mean, that's it. Now, you take the knowledge you have and the ability that you have to pass legislation, and you turn that into a career. Now, me, I decided I was going to also go back to law school, so that's what I'm doing on top of owning my own company. But, I mean, I realized my value was far significantly more than what I was, you know, getting. And I half the headache. And without listening to an individual, and my former supervisor was just, we were just not on the same page, you know. So I was so blessed that this opportunity came. I started it when uh, there were people that said I couldn't get it done. And uh, like I said, you know, here I are three years later, and most companies fail within five years, but here I am three years. I'm, I'm going strong, and hopefully in the next two years, things will get better. But if not, you know, there's always work to be done. That's right. You're still doing what you love, and uh, you'll have a law degree on top of that. And you, you're always mixing it up with uh, uh, people. So... Opportunities are always available when you're able to, you know, to meet people who are making policy and that you're a part of 
of that situation. I'm going to probably edit that all out. Alrighty, got the next one. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't flow well. Uh, Mississippi uh, lawyer, Mississippi lawyer will pay drug dealers and the gang members ten thousand dollars to leave his city. Yep. Not a well, bad investment. You want to comment? <laughs> well, no. You so, can pass. So. You can no, pass. it's not a pass. It's 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 a. So, I, I, are you familiar with Pikes? I don't know what the heck. What a pecky? Pikey, like a pikey, like uh, the, some people call them the ori- original Gaelic uh, gypsies. Uh, I don't think I do. And maybe I do and not really fully know it. Have you ever watched the movie Snatch with Brad Pitt? I don't know. I know I didn't do that. All right. So there's a movie called Snatch with Brad Pitt. If you ever get a chance or any of your fans get a chance to watch it, there are these characters that Brad Pitt is portraying called pikeys. And they speak in a very heavy Gaelic accent. Uh, and if you don't mind indulging me for a second, let's see if you can figure out what I was gonna, I'm about to say. Hey, why don't you go to the garden near the Pikes? You know what the caravan is? That's what they sound like. So basically I said, why don't you go wash your car down there where the doggies do? And do you know what a caravan is? Those are the two things I just said to you. And that's what Pikes sound like. But Pikes, uh, or the uh, original Gaelic gypsies in Ireland, the Pikes show up to places, and they have these little plots of land within communities, right? And the plots of lands, they own them. They are given to them to use at their disposal. But the Pikes have mastered the art of being annoying. They'll be so annoying. They'll throw all-night parties. They'll have their dogs walk around, their kids walk around. They'll throw diapers on the ground. They'll just make a mess until the neighborhood pays them to leave. That's what I really thought of when I saw this lawyer saying he was going to pay drug dealers to leave his community was basically like, look, you guys are such fuck ups that I'll pay you as much money as you want just to get the hell out of town. Now, they eventually come back every so often, but ultimately everyone gets what they want. A little peace and quiet for a little bit and the drug dealers make a couple bucks. I think I'm digging Pikes. I think that that's, they're great. It's a it's a it's a very unique kind of uh, situation out there in Ireland, but they they, they definitely aren't bad people. Uh, this one you wrote, uh, just to clarify, women are not the ones who will face uh, prison alone with a new laws pass. What these states did is the exact opposite of what New York City did when they pushed through a bill with no abortion limits. They simply, instead of removing the blame and conviction for doctors, have added it to the legislation where a doctor who performs the abortion will go to jail. Unless I miss something, this again is being sold to the public wrong to cause hysteria. Why do the exact same thing as the Republicans sold when New York City bill was passed? So I I guess I have to really explain that. And uh, please, uh, everyone, I want your fans to also understand that when I write generally for my post, I'm not actually at my laptop. I'm normally like on my phone, like heading somewhere. And I do suffer from severe dyslexia. So when people also come back and comment about I'm a retard because I can't write, I'm like, well, all right, I've been called that my whole life, but it's actually my dyslexia. Um, What happened is, is to quantify that conversation, to qualify it, is that um, New York earlier this year in the beginning of their General Assembly passed a repeal of a archaic rule that actually allowed for doctors who were performing abortions that could go to jail. Now, although the the law was never applied, um, it still was on the books. So what New York did was they removed this rule and they said, okay, we're going to remove it. But in doing so, they also removed the time frame. They removed any time limits around abortion, which New York had actually already done in the past, but they were just going to highlight it because the Republicans chose to. Uh, I will say this. I am for a choice because I do not have a uterus and it is not my job to tell other people what to do with their bodies. As an individual, I do believe in the sanctity of life. So if you do the, do- if you do the crime, you got to do the time. So you, if you get somebody pregnant, you know, you should follow through. But that's my personal opinion on what I would do, but I also don't sleep with women anymore. 
So the likelihoods of that happening are probably zero to none, although there would be that 1% that could potentially get me. Um, so that aside is that the law didn't match up, okay? So New York corrected the law. What then turned around and happened is Republicans started pushing it to their base. Now, the Democrats are very bad at mes messaging. Simply put, most Democrats say, you know, if they say, uh, you know, uh, abortion rights now or reproductive rights now, Republicans say killer, baby killer. You know, that, that's what they say. They say easy words that everyone's like, yeah, you're a baby killer. And then Democrats are like, no, 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 what we're doing is preserving the sanctity of life and fulfillment of human dignity and respect and children childbearing. And Republicans just keep saying baby killer. And Democrats come back with a longer saying, you know. There's a great quote in uh, uh, Al Franken's book, Giant of the Senate. It says, when Republicans make a bumper sticker, it fits on one side. American, patriot, honor, country. When Democrats write a bumper sticker, it says, please see other bumper sticker to clarify the statement on the first bumper sticker in which you'll see the third bumper sticker that actually has our message. So that's what Democrats and Republicans are, are, are opposite on. And that's what I was really feeling during this post is like, look, we're, they removed something in New York that was good for New York. But not everybody is monolithic. We're all not the same. This country was never, our forefathers definitely didn't expect this country to get this damn big. So when they decide to have conversations about our history and where we're moving our country towards, the forefathers didn't see, you know, uh, a single state that was the size of a country being the fifth largest economy in the world. I'm referring to California. Or Texas, which has most of the other, other uh, crude oil in it. I mean, we didn't think about these things. Now, although Texas was Mexico when they first uh, started this nation, so it's more like we stole that land. You know, it, it, it's that we have this idea that everybody's monolithic and we all think the same and we really don't. And so when we pass laws in Maryland, New York, California, but we don't really think about the middle of the country, that's when we start to see them take even deeper and worser and more 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 far right wing stances. Because as I like to tell a lot of my friends, I am the definition of a true conservative. I want the government out of my house, my bedroom, and my wallet. But I don't want the government completely out of my life. Because there is a need for it. When they say you can build it by yourself, no, you can't. Prime example of that is look at Tennessee, a state where they still have, uh, I believe it was like 28% of the, the, of the counties are unpaved roads. Or uh, Mumps Land in South Carolina, where that guy that I do not like, Charlemagne the God speaks about, where he grew up in a, a one lane, dirt track, trap house kind of country. You know, so we've got to really make sure that we're we're having these conversations with our our brothers and our sisters about about you know just just making ourselves making our laws like you know match our communities. Uh, Democrats, um, you know, hug the wrong trees. You know, they they're just not not on the right beat, and that causes a lot of problems. Also, you know, they're still funded by with large sums of money, and uh, senators are multimillionaires. You know, they they don't come in that way, but they leave that way. Well, actually, most senators do come in multimillionaires. It's very hard, and I'll I'll be very clear. It is very hard for a senator to run for office. I mean, even in a state, say like Montana, where it's about six hundred fifty thousand, unless you got money, you still can't crisscross the state. You can't put up television ads. You've got to have money to make money. I mean, those donors don't show up because you're, you know, just a great at policy. I mean, look at the city of Baltimore. So what I was doing with Baltimore was, is like, look at, so look at 
you know, there was a, so I was working on the Ben Jealous campaign and somebody said, you know, look at Baltimore. It's been run by Democrats for the last 50 years and it's no better off. And all I could think of is Baltimore was run by like old rich white guys. And for 50 years, yeah, 50 years might seem like a long time, but if you really think about it, uh, John F. Kennedy was, what, murdered in, what, 64, 65? No, 66, right? I don't remember. He was 63. All right, so he's murdered. Yeah, so he's murdered in 63, right? So uh, by 58, or I'm sorry, by by 64, um, uh, 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 LBJ, a redneck from Texas, while shitting, while sitting on the shitter, decides, you know, we're going to pass the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to get black folks to vote for us for the next hundred years. He said these things. So the Democrats never really thought about black people in terms of, you know, being real voters. He just voted. He thought of us as just being voters for the Democratic Party. Now, relate that back to Baltimore and you see the exact same thing. You know, you saw uh, us, you know, we've only had, we've only actually had two, uh, one elected African-American mayor, male. You know that? In the city of Baltimore. And that was Kurt Schmidt. Oh yeah, Kurt Schmidt. Yeah. Duke De Burns was appointed. Sheila was appointed. She ascended because O'Malley left. Now she might have, you know, she won an election, but then she she lost it, right? And then SRB uh, it gets appointed, and then you know she runs, she wins an election, and then you know obviously things didn't turn out too well. And then S, uh, and then and then Catherine Pugh, and now we have Jack Young. So of every African American mayor that's been through this city, there's been trauma and turmoil associated with them. But it's not that they're black; it's because the white guys for the last sixty years were screwing everything up. It's like when I told somebody about playing spades. If you learn how to play spades from people that cheat all the time, you think cheating is normal. You think it's part of the game. You think that you're supposed to put a fifth extra 50 in somebody's pocket or that you're supposed to give them uh, an extra sandwich or buy them beer and drinks every night. That's what people thought the game was about. Greasing a few palms, kissing a few babies. Instead of actually helping your community, most people were just helping themselves. And then they come back and say, well, you know, my family's been in Baltimore for 60 years. Yeah, you were in Baltimore for 60 years, but in those 60 years, your family's done quite well while the neighborhood that you claim to represent has gone down drastically. But you're still living up in that hog hog heaven. You're still going up to the bygone every Friday and Saturday night. Most people don't even know what the bygone is. So anyway, that's my little rant on that one. Okay, this is another Maryland one. Today is reason number one, Hogan kills me. Either sign the bill or let us. They will go to veto or just let them pass. Now all 300 are just up in the air for no reason. Three years working on this same bill and I can't get some closure. So I was working on a Drug Price Affordability Act um, and it passed. Well, it didn't pass. You know, it just became law. But. You know, for the last three years, you know, I worked really hard on, on, on with, a, with a coalition over at the Maryland Citizens Healthcare Initiative to, to pass this drug price affordability bill. It's something that's good for the people. And every time we went up against big, and this is a, we defeated big pharmaceutical companies. We, be, we defeated big pharma. But the fact is, is that the governor took that, he took my glory away from me. And he kills me. You know, he's always like, oh, we got to do something. He wrote a letter two years ago complaining that the, 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 the prescription, the generics prescription bill that was passed didn't far enough. We need to go after, um, you know, the, the, the branded medications, those that are, are, are on patent. We do that, and then he doesn't sign the bill? Like, what a hypocrite. You know, it's like I said before. 
Governor Hogan, if you're listening, just wait for the polling to tell you what to do. That's all it is. It's all about polling for him. I mean, he's a good, let me give you this much. He is a smart political man. Very smart politically. I don't think he's, I don't think he's racist or biased. I think he's just very good at what he does politically. But when he says, I'm a businessman, nah, Larry. Big Larry, Larry Larry, you're not a businessman that's just good at, that decided you want to get into politics. You were born into this. Your father was one of the first people to speak out against Nixon back in the 70s. Your father was ultimately punished by the Republican Party for it. And now this is your time to make up for how they treated him. Now, you might be a Republican on paper, but I definitely know that this governor, he is a true conservative. He believes in the same things that I do sometimes. If it makes fiscal sense, he'll do it. If it doesn't, he don't want to touch it. And he stays away from social issues. There's nothing that anyone can say different. The governor just stays away from social issues, which, again, is smart. You know, I like this idea He's that he's in there for revenge. Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I could just see him, like, plotting out his revenge. Friends of Something Came From Baltimore, you need to stay in tune. We're going to have part two coming up. In the near future, you need to subscribe. You need to share. You need to comment. Um, give your feedback to Akil. Akil. If someone was going to try to get a hold of you in the public sphere, uh, where do you recommend that they, they comment or make comments? Uh, they can go to my Instagram page at Life of a Lobbyist. It's uh, a little bit long, but it's Life underscore of underscore a underscore lobbyist. Life of a Lobbyist. Life of a Lobbyist with three underscores after Life of and A. Um, and then they can always go to uh, my Twitter. I think that's at Akil Patterson, but, you know, either way, it's Twitter. They can just find me. Yeah, you're out there. You're easy to find. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm, not, yeah I'm definitely ain't hiding. Yeah. I had to tell somebody that today. I'm not hiding. So thank you, Akil. Uh, with the life of a lobbyist with Akil, show number one. Something came from Baltimore. Something came from Baltimore. Something came from Baltimore.